actually before that, we were talking to everybody at Dior, and I had, I quite strongly felt that I wanted to work with Roman Gavras. Um, I'd wanted to work with him for a long time before, and I couldn't really find a thing to do with him. Um, and I got involved with that, and I, I remember bringing up his name, and everyone was like, Oof, I don't know about Roman Gavras, <laughs> like it's, too, it's maybe a little bit too far out there. As soon as everyone agreed to it, I started to think, wow, we want, everybody wants to do something kind of on the same page, and then we're all thinking of doing something really different. Romance style. Uh, do you want to say something to the no, camera no, 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 about the show? What did you think of the show? I ain't got an answer for that. Okay. Yeah. No, the show's been great. Overwhelming, uh, overwhelmingly positive response. Mm -hmm. um, feels like it's really connected with people who are fans of the brand. Seems to have really um, awoken all people's love for Adidas. It's nice the way we present modern products in the context of vintage products. Mm -hmm. And also to show the lineage of sports technologies that have been developed through our guest footwear from the 60s right through to 2014, things like Boost. Mm -hmm. Okay. And where's it going to next? Paris. And do you hope it has the same sort of impact there? Uh, it's the first time we've taken it outside the UK. Uh, it'll be interesting to see because there's a really strong connection between Adidas and France. A lot of the manufacturing was done in France in the 1980s. Mm -hmm. um, but France doesn't necessarily have the same subcultures that we have in the UK. So, yeah, it'll be interesting to see what the response is. All right, what's your name? My name's Gary Aston, and I curated the exhibition and I executed it. Right, thanks a lot. Someone who lives life on his own terms completely. Yeah, he's like the kind of guy who gets into fights in a tuxedo. <laughs> it's like, I mean, I mean, hopefully, anyway, that's hopefully that's how people interpret it. Um, yeah, there's something. Yeah, there's something innately elegant, and well, especially in people who, in, in foreign people's eyes, about French people, but they kind of seem very classy, 100% of the time. Um, and I think even though there's a lot of energy and a lot, the the commercial is very visceral, it kind of it does still have very natural elegance to it. Um, I've, I've, I've had difficulty sort of, you know, just being able to relax with a piece of paper. And Quite wild, um, hopefully pretty sexy. <laughs> um, something quite elegant, but fast paced about it, and um, quite visceral and powerful. You think about Brazil, you think about soccer, football. Football, that's how we say it. Brazil is it. No, I don't play soccer, I wish. But my son can do it. I have two sons, actually. But my older son, he actually doesn't like it. But I forced him, because it, since it's a Brazilian, you know, culture. I'm planning on being in Brazil for the World Cup. Hopefully, I'll watch Brazil on the, on the finals. I really hope to be on the stadium. Hopefully on the grounds, you know, I don't know if I will get to get there, you know, on the grounds to feel all the energy from the people. I hope so. I don't play soccer anymore, but when I was a kid, my brother and his friends were always playing in the garden. So they let me join in in their game, but I wasn't very good at it and I'll kick them in the shin and then they'll get mad and throw me out. <laughs> I don't play soccer. In Brazil, the tradition is boys play soccer and girls play with fashion. Yeah, Iman is a good one to know. <laughs> it's like, what's up, bro, you know? If you see somebody cute in the street, you can say, gato, gato. If you're a gringo and you hear some Brazilians going around, you say, you're a gato. So you know what that means. It's uh, shine from the inside and feel confident. That's what people see when they look at you. I love being, like, being around someone that's just like oozes with like love for themselves, like not in an arrogant way or anything, but, you know, like even if they look like just like baggies, you know, they can so, still look like the second person in their life. Interview with Paul from Notes in Manchester, uh, Wednesday, the what's the date today? 25th. 25th, um, in the skate shop. So, Paul, introduce yourself. 
Um, I'm Paul Rogers and I'm the uh, manager of Note. Okay. And what kind of thing do you do at Note? We sell skateboards, trailers, clothes. Yeah, that sort of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> skateboards, trailers and clothes. Right. Um, and what inspires what you do? Um, not sure. Our, our hobbies, our interests, our, our, our friends, our fashions, music. I don't know. Whatever we're into. And is there a big um, skate scene in the northwest? And um, in particular, is there a skate scene in the northern quarter? I'd say, I don't know about the northern quarter. I mean, there's skate shops in the northern quarter, but there's a big skate scene in Manchester. Um, probably one of the biggest in the country. Um, there's big scenes in Liverpool and Leeds and Huddersfield too, but I think Manchester, given that, you know, with all the students and stuff, there, there's a particularly big scene here. So what have been the best parts of uh, best bits of your career and the worst bits? Um, in terms of doing a shop, I don't know. I mean, I think the best things have been like the video premieres and uh, like the get-togethers we've organised. Just any any excuse to bring the whole scene together, get everyone in one place at one time. Um, they've probably been the highlights and the most memorable things. Um, yeah, and I guess the fact. We managed to keep the shop open for 15 years and been like relatively successful. That's an overall quite a kind of, I don't know, a highlight for me. And what are your plans for the future? Um, well, for the minute, I don't know. We've just opened this new shop on Thomas Street. That's uh, for, the, for the future. I, I don't know, I haven't really thought much past that, just to carry on doing what we're doing. Um, yeah, perhaps try and grow the website side of the business. Uh, other than that, we're pretty happy with the presence we've got in there in Manchester. So, yeah, just work on our website a bit. Uh, why the change? Why did you change from the shop where you were to this shop? Both shops are both in the Northern Quarter. Yeah, we've still got the other shop. We're doing two shops now. Okay. We just ran out of room in that shop. We did this shop to concentrate on the clothes and the trainers and that shops to concentrate on the, the skateboards and the skateboard brands, the skateboard kind of t-shirts and shoes and stuff. This, this, this uh, shop's a bit more fashion, that one's strictly kind of hardware and proper hardcore skateboard stuff. Then you get to collect football t-shirts, not skateboarding t-shirts. So, I've got that to go with the world. I've got Russia 1977. And what's your favourite thing right now? I've got Favourite thing in the shop? Spain. Uh, not necessarily in the shop, what's your favourite thing at the moment? Uh, in general? Um, I don't know, I, I personally like going out on, uh, on my road bike. I've got like a bike that I like riding up into the peaks and stuff like that. And, uh, yeah, and just uh, you know, getting out of the town centre for a bit and chilling. I spend so much time in the town centre, it's, it's nice to get out into the country a bit on my, on my bike and go blow some steam off and stuff. So yeah, that's probably my favourite thing to do right now. What kind of bike have you got? Um, well, the, what, the road bike's like uh, the Bianchi bike. I don't know what much about it, but it's just a nice road bike, got gears on it and stuff, and nice and fast and light. Yeah. And do you still skate a lot? Me? No, not really. I mean, my background was more BMX, that's how I got into all this. I've always been into cycling and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, these days, just I, I tend to get one or two days off a week, and on those days, I just get on my road bike and get out of the city. So, yeah, I haven't really been down in skate parks or out on the street. It's just putting signage or something well, an integral part of this earth as humans, you know what I mean? Uh, and we should be of an intelligence and of awareness by now, but we know it's not good to fight, it's not good to discriminate, it's not really good to, to knock, knock people down, do you know what I mean? It's, it's not good to be eating and living well when people have nothing to eat. It's not good to be taking the piss out of people who don't know 
that nasty way of thinking and otherwise you know your Amazonian Indian is getting kicked off his land so that McDonald's can go and make some more fucking space for some cows so we can all have cheap hamburgers. Mm-hmm. What I'm saying is we must all help each other make each other aware and although every man thinks well it's nothing to do with me and why should I bother and life's hard enough anyway. There's still something we can do, I know it. There's still something we can do from the fact that I'd like to be able to walk down the street and you see the next man and he goes, Alright then, how you doing? Yeah. What is it a pussy doing that? Nobody's being a pussy doing that, do you know what I mean? And the people are more and more realising this, so we have to create a vibe to ourselves. We need each other. You know, in a way, we're being run. You know, we're in a system, it's being run by some people who sit at the top. Uh-huh. They have a privileged position there. They're not using that position properly. But the director of public prosecution gets caught in King's Cross. Like, you know, the Guinness guy, you know what I mean? Not happy with the millions he's already got, has to try and scam a few more million. We're dealing with greedy people who are on power trips that are... Oh yes indeed, I am very addicted to social media. Why? Because... When I'm bored, I, it's the only thing that keeps me entertained, you know. I think a little bit and I have to watch out because as soon as I'm not doing something and I'm bored, and I'm like, okay, so it's instant. I take the phone and I'm like, let me check. I love looking at images and, and fashion and different um, pictures. So I think that's the addicting thing with Instagram is... is being stimulated in that way all the time. I love like, oh, like to buy um, a, a phone stick or a whatever you have to make it yourself. So they're all like I, I five little pieces of the gadgets squirreling away in their, in their shed, um, creating these things. So again, just some of them, I mean, you know, the plus like Phil, who made this fantastic discovery about hippos, he had a hundred friends attached two sticks that's wrapped that's around the a hamster run. Um, and in a, uh, in a moment, <laughs> yeah, it's a hamster run. So yeah, yeah, it's it's like a hamster run. Sick. And, and if there's another the size of the hamster run, it's using a pair of his mother's law of tights stretched over a very important piece of kit that costs half a million quid that normally tests vibrations on jumbo jet. Um, so they're all sort of coupled together from all from all different things. And they're both monkeys. You know, I'm just using a garden wall because there have been no leopards in in Mombasa. Yeah. For 20 years, so I, I had to go work. and get this garden ornament to show them. And then I, I was when I was doing the I had, um, I had a, a, a broken car that actually broke halfway through the experiment. I was thinking this isn't going to work, but it did it still did work. So, you know, it's just weird. You're talking about a lot of exotic animals. There are people at home now thinking, why don't you talk to my dog or cat every day and they understand every word? And I can understand that, you know, I can understand the noises that they make too. Is that a version of the same thing? Because some people say they absolutely understand. Over a million. Twitter, I think over a million yeah, to uh, Instagram, I'm well, about I'm to be a million now. So we have, just did like, about animals so speaking to each other, but I, mean, I, I do know that, that dogs, for instance, million, think, and the reason why they're man's best friend is because they have a really fantastic um, ability to read each other's emotions and communication. So whether you are, you really understand what it's saying all the time with those loving, adoring uh, eyes and, uh, you know, the yelps or whatever, but uh, there is definitely uh, an ease of communication there. Uh, which do you think is the most effective communicator? Was it the dolphin? Uh, um, there were some surprises. I mean, the, 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 the chimpanzees were extraordinary. I mean, we were in last night's show, but well, some of the things that surprised me most were for some of the smaller animals that you wouldn't expect to have a sophisticated language. Yes, spiders, but then like tonight's show, there's a, there's a, like a bird, really it's called a chickadee, that has, it's called, it's animated with four notes, but according to how those notes are played, um, it has an open-ended language, as do we, and, and it's, so, it's so open the language that it requires the rules of grammar to control it, so they're, they're like these English teachers, why am I not just and if you just look at the bird in your garden, it's completely different life. Can you do a bird noise for us? There are various industries where they follow things that their family have done before them and you really can't help yourself you just keep coming back it's interesting you talk about your family because i do we talked a bit about the present month but i want to go back and talk about sort of your earliest memories of fashion and you mentioned that that idea of clothes as as communication and were you quite aware of that as a young boy growing up looking at people and and sort of reading things about them based on how they presented themselves yeah i mean my earliest memory was walking down the king's road with my parents and i was mid to late 70s punk. I was very young. Um, And I was holding my mother's hand and my father's hand 
and I had flannel, grey flannel trousers on, very much as I was wearing today, Italian chocolate suede loafers, a little cashmere v-neck, and I'd see these punks on the King's Road in this square where they'd all sit with brightly coloured tartan and hair, and I felt, yeah, it was fear, I felt fear, but the fear came um, from observing how they were dressed. So at a very early age, I understood communication through clothing, or the power of that communication through clothing. I think that's what a lot of designers maybe subconsciously try to understand, or maybe they don't understand, or maybe they do. I don't, I don't know. But that's how I felt it, really clearly, at a young age. And I thought we could communicate some kind of um, feeling, or some people want to call it energy, through how you're dressed. And that obviously makes sense through uniform and how people portray themselves. And maybe that's what led me to Savile Row ultimately, because of the power or the energy connection, maybe, I don't know. Mm. I'm still thinking about it. What was the point, though, where the idea of, of a career in fashion entered your consciousness? Was it when you were still at school, were you a boy? It still hasn't. <laughs> um, I don't know if I've ever done fashion, per se. Mm. I don't know what I think I do, actually, because um, it's, it's creation and it's ideas and sometimes it manifests itself in the clothing. Well, the clothing part, as a designer these days and for the last 15 years, has been such a small part of it mm. because you're building um, the layers of the brand. Well, that's how I see the design. I see everything. Mm. So it's the photography, it's the station, it's the graphics, it's the context, it's uh, colour, it's not just the yeah, advertised clothing. Yeah. So what so a large part of it, but a um, new online community. It's not like it's so studios, yeah. That's why yeah, um, um, I never became a tailor. <laughs> That's what we thought. <laughs> so, I'm a designer. No, I just, um, I'm full stop. I understand the discipline, I love the discipline of craft, but I didn't focus on that because what I've observed over the years is that you can be one of two people in these I actually have some pictures. You could be the technical person, or you could be the idea person. But it's very, very different. Do you think that the row hasn't quite adapted to that? Do you think that's the problem? It's too focused on the precision and the detailing and not enough on the It's like show and tell, this is awesome. Yeah, so <laughs> yeah like this, that just came out in another magazine, it's like just portraits um, yeah. it is of um, sexist, misogynistic, that um, you found on Tumblr. So you found them all on Tumblr? Extent, yeah, some of them were uh, it wasn't friends, an family. Um, it was archaic, just not yeah. everywhere. Just Why do you love the internet so much? Because you're so pro Tumblr, your time. social media, I made but a you, real point of point you also have this magazine side to you. I wonder how you sort of bring the two together. Yeah. Yeah. Just to rebalance the energy, because kind of, uh, it, it can't be right. Like that, that can't be right. Everyone thinks I'm like a... It's not Savile's fault. It's just the way that some sectors of like like work or industries just my Instagram and Twitter and time. Mm -hmm. Couture so was very I, firm I, I suppose I Paris, just use, use, really didn't have anything um, to do with London with the exception of people like Mark Bowen and Hartnell mm -hmm. and, and Hardy Avies who were existent but they didn't have the power and influence in French houses. So you use it more to get inspiration than to put yourself out there? Oh yeah, totally. The English way of promotion up until the I don't do with Google anymore, I just do it on Tumblr or Very so much, uh, it yeah. is, and, I ask and people, what I love about my English, um, to be very observed, so I'm kind of so like cheating, <laughs> don't shout about it it's, it's much. almost nice, it's, it's, it's nice to do with everyone, and you collaborate, but don't be shouting from the rooftops, but ultimately, it's made you quite when business a celebrity, do you like that, over, or do you, you not think about it like that, that. you have to develop, I don't know, it's and the only nice thing, and shout as elegantly as possible, really. So is that what Squire was about? Let's talk about Squire because you've mentioned it in passing. Yeah, sorry, but I want to pick up. Was it about you know, shouting, saying this is what I'm about, this is my ideas? Well, I went to St Martin's for an interview to try and get into the fashion course, and I didn't get in. And then I went to try and get in on the uh, fun art course, and I, I didn't get in. <laughs> so I thought. Oh, so what's your name? Fine. What do you do? I work in the skate shop up there. Yeah. Yeah. What's it like working in the skate shop? It's, it's, it's pretty cool because I get to get to like a skateboard as well. So I get to be around the skateboard in all the time because they work separate. Yeah. Yeah. Which is fun. Okay. Have you been to have a look at the Adidas shop? Yeah, yeah, I went yesterday. What do you think of it? I think it's great. It's exactly the same thing. It's a 3D object. What's your favourite shoe? You can't stay with it. What's your favourite shoe, uh, <laughs> <laughs> your favorite uh, shoe for skating? Uh, no America's. Uh, yeah. So America's are the best. Why do you like bands? Squire. Uh, yeah. uh, yeah. kind of like, good skate shoes, like, not well made. Uh, okay. 
Yeah. How long have you been skating? Well, 89 years now. They were done of you. Yeah. Are you going to go pro? Yeah. What's your favourite skate company? What's so good about them? Like this, the, the stuff is there, like the old era, and that stuff on the board. Skating gloves, hands down, and Oliver Prado. He was probably the only Italian that focused on that area, because the rest of Italy just ignored modernism through the 90s until Tom Ford arrived at Gucci. You mentioned, you know, but sort of trying to break down these boundaries between art and design and fashion, yeah. and because Squire did so much in terms of the people that were involved in it and. T talk to me about some, some of the artists that you worked with, you know, Alan Jones, Bridget Riley. Yeah, it was serendipity. I mean, in 92, I had a studio in Brewer Street, and along the street was Dave and Few started in the same year or just afterwards. And one, the first three people that knocked on my door were Katie Grant, um, Simon Fox and the Nick Knight, and Isabella Blow. <laughs> those were the first people that came to my door. Uh, you have to remember, in those days, there was no internet, there was no mobile phone. It was word of mouth. And Isabella, for example, came up with Alexander McQueen. And he was in his last year at St. Martin's. And he came in and he was, you know, he was really shy. And he sat on my couch and I had this tiny little attic in Brewer Street. It was an old brothel, which Izzy loved. And she said, oh, you know, meet Alexander. I'm going to buy his last collection. And he's the future of women's fashion. Um, so those first few people that started to come through were really, really, really important. Helmut Lang was a real fan at the beginning, and um, a lot of the moleskin things that I did, the covered coats, the trousers, were popularised by Helmut in later years. So I was really lucky the people that were interested. Magazines would shoot something or write about something, but people couldn't see the imagery or the collection for three, four, five, six months. So it had to happen by word of mouth. Mm. Um, it's Obviously, the, the natural progression was to get a space, which I got in um, Clifford Street. And um, it was an old art gallery, and originally an old brothel as well. Funnily enough, there's a theme popping in <laughs> to the work. And it was next door to something called the Bucks Club, Bucks Club on Clifford Street. So I moved in, and I didn't want a lot of rails. And I was interested in art, obviously. I was specifically interested in pop art at the time. And if you remember, 93, 94, 95, 96, contemporary art hadn't made its mark, okay? A lot of pop artists like Alan Jones, Bridget Riley, who's technically a pop artist, um, even Warhol to a certain extent, there are images that people had seen. There were a lot of English pop artists and non-English pop artists, people like Eduardo Paolozzi, who's very fashionable now, have been the last five or six years, that people just hadn't seen and weren't aware of, and they didn't even rate. Um, so I wanted to have a space that was part art gallery and part design gallery. So the clothing would sit in the centre and the art and to a certain extent furniture would be on the outside. And this was before places like Dover Street, yeah. Market and um, Colette I think.